Acts chapter 5. This past week, uh, Kim and I uh, headed to Joshua's graduation from the Border Patrol Academy in, in Artesia, New Mexico. And before we left, we left Monday afternoon. Before we left, I stopped by to see uh, uh, Roy Heimbecker. Roy Heimbecker is an old, old friend, um, and he's been around San Angelo. I've known him all the years that he's been around. In fact, I wrote in my, my article this past week about Roy Heimbecker. But the, the part about Roy Heimbecker that I want to tell you this morning is not what I wrote about in my article, but it's his background. Roy Heimbecker, when he was a young pastor, was a Methodist pastor. And when he started preaching that salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, he was called to the carpet by the, the district people overseeing the ministry that he was doing. And I think he was in his late 20s at the time. He and Mary, uh, who is now with the Lord uh, at the time, uh, she, she, uh, uh, they, they were pastoring a small church. And, and Roy was called to the carpet. And he had to appear before these distinguished uh, supervisors, religious supervisors, that oversaw his work. And he was asked to stop preaching Christ that way, that there is a role that man plays, that it's not predominantly God who, who saves people, and that Christ simply did what he did, but it's up to man to, to seek God out in salvation, and it's up to man to basically do the things necessary for him to earn salvation. And Roy from, Roy did not tell me this, but it was his wife, Mary, when she was still alive, and his family, uh, because the story had been passed on down, was the one who, were, they were the ones who told me what had happened, and basically Roy said, no, I will not stop preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Most of you know Martin Luther uh, who lived a little over a hundred years after another man who named John Huss in Reformation history was one guy who also suffered and died for his faith. And of course, Luther was a Catholic monk. And when he saw how far the church had gone from biblical truth, he nailed his 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg church as a protest, as a basically a statement of faith that this is something wrong and these are the things that must be true. And anyway, and, all of, and he's also written a lot of books and he was also called before a council, a very distinguished council. It's called the Diet of Worms. It was in April 15, April 17, 1521. And in this council where he was surrounded by not just by spectators, some of them his friends, a lot of them his friends, but a lot of distinguished people representing the religious, ecclesiastical, uh, uh, top-notch people of, of, at that time, and also the, the state. And they laid out 25 books on the table, and he was asked two questions, both in German and in Latin. They asked him, he says, are these books yours? And then the second question that they asked him, he says, will you recant them? Will you take your words back? Martin Luther looked around, and he probably was a little bit intimidated by, what, by all this appearance of this majesty and the grandeur of this, this convocation. And so he kind of hesitated, and he asked the emperor to give him one day to, re, to consider what the, the questions that were posed before him. And that night, he had time to think about what had happened. And so the, the next day, the moderator asked him one once again, if he would defend his books or whether he would recant any part of them. Luther's response was this. It was pretty fascinating. And he divided his books into three parts. He said, books on simple evangelical truths that even his enemies agreed with. He said, these he could not recant. Books against the corruption of the, of the Pope and the, Pope, the papal system. He said, these he could not retract without cloaking wickedness and tyranny. Books against his popish opponents. He said, these, he admitted, were too vitriolic, 
However, he could not retract those either, lest his enemies triumph and make things worse. Martin Luther then, amazingly, and with great courage, and most of you have seen even the adaptation in the movie of that story of his in the recent years, said these things to the people gathered there, asking him to recant his words. He said, unless I am refuted and convicted by testimonies of the Scriptures or by clear arguments, since I believe neither the Pope nor the councils alone, it being evident that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. He says, I am conquered by the Holy Scriptures, quoted by me, and my conscience is bound in the Word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it is unsafe and dangerous to do anything against the conscience. He says, I will not. The type of persecution did not end in the 15, 1600s. The type of persecution still goes on. Of course, the type of persecution started long before Martin Luther, long before Roy Heimbecker, long before John Huss. Right from the beginning of the birth of the church, there were people already trying to suppress the spread of the gospel, the spread of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have seen this after after Peter and John had gone into the temple at three in the afternoon, like every good Jew would do, they were still participating in those things. And there was a man who, was, who, had, been, who had been a paralytic, and he, he, he healed him. And then he joined in, in, this man joined in the worship of the Lord in, 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 in the temple. And then people started to begin to gather. And then Peter proclaimed who Christ was and how this man was healed. And it was by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, let me say this to you this morning. In a, in a congregation, in a culture, in a world, in the United States, and even in West Texas, where it seems like the very people, believers, are somehow duped into thinking that the goal in life is simply to be healed, let it be understood and let it sink into our hearts that the goal of God has always been for the name of Christ to be proclaimed. And this is what Peter did. He said, why are you looking at us as if it is by our own power we heal this man? It is by the name of Jesus Christ. They were arrested for that. They were told never to proclaim the name of Christ again. And they left. And they, actually, before they left, they addressed the Sanhedrin. And they said to them, he said, should we obey men rather than God? And then uh, they said, we cannot help but speak about the things we have seen and we have heard. That's something that you will find all throughout the Scriptures and all throughout Christian history, that men and women of God who have been gripped by who Christ is, by their true salvation, true salvation meaning that they understood what has been the heart of God from the beginning of time, that God, that God says that they may know me, that you may know me, that the nation of Israel may know me, that that the, the world, that the other nations would know that I, the Lord your God, was the one who did this. That Jesus said in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know me, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. This is the heart of the gospel. This is the heart of who we are as followers of Christ. The, the purpose that we have is not simply so you and I can live a long life and live in, in luxury and uh, free of problems and any of that, but that in everything that goes on in our lives, that Christ is going to be honored, that Christ is going to be magnified, and that Christ is going to be proclaimed, both with our lips and with our lives. But that truth is oftentimes lost to us today. So I just want to encourage you, to, as we look at this, to consider what the Lord is saying here and what is really the heart of the gospel. The gospel is not simply someone praying a prayer or someone who just simply walking down the aisle, and then they can go and live whatever, however they want to live their lives. And then even Sunday mornings when people, the writer of Hebrews says, Let, do not forsake the assembling of the saints. And Sunday mornings for us have become like just a, one of the choices that we have because we have relegated Christ to simply an, a duty and an obligation that we do, which is a, a, a box to check off on. But he's not like that. He's a God who desires fellowship with his with his followers, with his with believers. And so when after Peter and, and John were 
were released. Two of them were arrested, and they were released, and they continued on the ministry. And actually, they went back, and they prayed. And remember the prayer that they prayed when everybody gathered, and they told them that they had been arrested, and they were told to quit preaching the name of Christ. And they prayed, says, Lord, give us the boldness to continue proclaiming your word, and says, stretch out your hand for healing and signs and miracles in the name of Christ, not for signs and miracles and wonders alone, but so as we do these things, they will see who Christ is. And they will hear about who Christ is. That is the purpose of everything, by the way, that we do. All, all of the activities that we do, whatever they may be, I, Philip and Ryan, Micah, our elders, uh, Rex, Fred and Andrew, they hear this from me a lot. If what we're doing does not contribute to proclaiming who Christ is, let's quit doing them. Because that's really the heart of who we are. Listen, we do not exist as College Hills Baptist Church so we can just continue to function week after week. No, Christ died for us so that you and I can be the vehicles, so you and I can be the conduits of His grace, so you and I can be the vessels, as, he, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, that we can be the vessels of this wonderful gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that no matter what happens to us, that Christ is proclaimed. That's who we are. So, they began to minister. Of course, God began to answer their prayers. God gave them boldness, and, and they were going about doing all kinds of signs and miracles. And we saw last week how there were even people laying there, they're, they're, they're sick, and just for the shadow of Peter to, to just pass by these this people who are sick, and then they would be healed. What, for what reason? Okay, class, here's a quick test. I know it's spring break, but we have a quick quiz here. For what reason were those people being healed? Tell me. And the what? To point to who God is, to point that Jesus is the Messiah, that the prophet Joel said, that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he said then that this Yahweh that Joel talks about is Jesus whom the religious leaders had killed. And so in verse 17, when the people, when people began to follow these guys, and they continued to preach Christ. It didn't stop them. They continued to go into the temple proclaiming who Christ was. And people were getting healed. And there, a lot of them were, uh, in verse 13, it says, No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So the, the group was growing. And, of course, these this religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, especially the Sadducees, were being afraid and going, Oh, my, our, our position is threatened. And so what happens, verse 17, then the high priest, the high priest was a member of the Sadducees. The high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees, notice what, what their reaction was, what these guys' reactions were. They were filled with jealousy. They were filled with jealousy. They didn't even see what God was doing through these guys, but their hearts were filled with jealousy because these guys had more followers than they did. I remember Tony Evans talking about years ago when I got to attend the inaugural uh, worship service they had in their new facilities. This is a long time ago, almost 20 years ago now. He said, there's a little church, a small church just down the road from them. And he said, you know, I hate to admit this. He said, but my idea has always been, you know, the bigger you are, the better you are, the grander you are, and all of these things. And he said, and I've always thought that we are in competition against all these other churches in the, in the neighborhood. He said, I get a phone call from this pastor of this small church. And I knew some of our people have been parking in their parking lot. And I'm going, oh no, he's going to gripe me out. And the pastor on the other line said, Dr. Evans, this is so-and-so. I'm pastor at the church down the street. He said, you know, we don't have a lot of members in our church. And I noticed there's a lot of people in your church. He said, we want to officially asked you and let you know that your members are welcome. Let your members know that they can park in our parking lot. See, people who understand the work of the gospel, there's no jealousy involved. It's simply a heart that says, if Christ is proclaimed, let it be. What Paul said in Philippians, it doesn't really matter what the, what the motives are of these people who were, who were preaching Christ. He said, so long as, as Christ is preached. That's the biggest thing. You know, we can look at this text and go, man, those guys are weird. 
But how many of us today in this culture, how many of us compare one church against the other? How many of you have ever been just church shopping where you look at the different things that a church, you know, can I be honest with you? Not that I haven't been honest with you, but, but a lot of people treat churches like Gold's Gym or an exercise facility. Let's see, this church offers more stuff than this other church. And they also have, their preacher doesn't preach as long as Lacan does. You know? Um, I mean, we, we do that. You know, we, we've got this, this, this marketing mentality. And we pursue the things that we want. Kind of like these guys. They were jealous. They didn't care about Christ. They didn't care that there was this promise that, that Peter had just proclaimed. Joel chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Didn't matter to them. Didn't matter that they had been confronted by the Son of God, who is the Messiah. It didn't matter to them. All they wanted was their position in society. They didn't want to upset the Romans. And they were jealous. So what did they do? Verse 18, they arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, and the angel tells the disciples, the apostles. He said, go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. Now, some of your translations, if you have a New American Standard this morning, or if you have an a, 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 a American uh, Revised Version, uh, I'm sorry, the Authorized Version, you will find that the word life is capitalized. It is capitalized. Because what they're trying to point out, and the, the translators are trying to do, is to make a point that this is not simply improving your life. This is not home improvement 101 or, or whatever it is that they have on HGTV. This is not what this is about. This is about the new life that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5.17. That we have, those, if you know Christ, that you have been given new life. You have this new life. Everything is gone. Everything has become new. The old is gone, and everything has become new for you. Are you given the Spirit of God, and through the Spirit of God, through the Holy Spirit who lives in you, through God who lives in you, as, he, as you understand the Scriptures and you begin to have a different perspective about life, about death, about, about relationships, about money, about resources, about the world, about heaven, about the future, about Everything else in this world, it gives you that perspective. It's a, it's a new life. The world doesn't understand it. It's a, and the angel tells him, says, proclaim the full message of this new life. And so at daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail... The officers did not find him there. So they re went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, and with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this, we found, on hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Now, it's, it's, Probably when Luke was recording this for us, he probably was chuckling a little bit because the Sadducees didn't believe in angels. And yet he records for us that the one who, who freed the apostles was an angel. And then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. By the way, did you notice the first time they were arrested, who were arrested earlier on? Someone tell me. Quiz number two. What? Peter and John. Now here, who had been arrested here? Don't look at me. Look at the text. Who? The apostles. All of them. So the persecution is intensifying. First they arrested Peter and John. They released them, told them never to proclaim the name of Christ again. And then they continued to proclaim the name of Christ because they said, we cannot help but speak about the things we have seen and heard. And we would rather obey God rather than obey man. It doesn't matter what man says. What, what matters to us is what God says. And God has commissioned us to proclaim his message. And so we're doing that. And so they arrested all of them, the 12 of them, the 11 plus Matthias. Verse 27. 
Well, sorry, verse 25. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers, brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. By the way, if you're a member, if you're one who is like the religious leaders at the time, if all you care about is your position, if all you care about is preserving your status, you would also be afraid of things. You'll be afraid of the Roman government. You'll be afraid of what people would say and what people would do. But people of God, like the apostles, were fearless, not because they were just great guys, but because their hearts had been seized by the Holy Spirit, and they knew what is important in their life. Verse 27, having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. Now, I was mentioning earlier about Martin Luther and even Roy Heimbecker. These proceedings, there, these were official proceedings, and the same thing here with the apostles. The Sanhedrin was official religious, secular. It, 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 it basically took care not just of the religious aspect of the life of the nation, but also the secular aspect of that. And that's why they're in, in cahoots with, with the Romans. And so there was this high priest with his elegant robe and his headgear and all the rest of the members of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And this distinguished-looking group, and then here comes the 12 apostles, ordinary men. And then Peter I'm sorry, the, the, verse 28, the high priest says, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty. Notice, he couldn't even say, the high priest couldn't even say the name of the Lord Jesus Christ's name. He said, Yet you, have, you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging, hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that we might have repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. Now, the religious leaders were the ones who are supposed to be the guardians of the truth of the law. They were supposed to be the ones who were teaching the people that this is God, what God said, what He had said, the promise of the, the, the Proto-Evangelium in, in, in Genesis chapter 3, the first mention of the gospel, the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman that was echoed in, in all of scriptures, and they, they're supposed to know that. And yet they killed the very one that was the answer to the promise of God who was the Messiah. And Peter and the apostles were the ones who said, He is the one. He is prince and savior. And he is the one, basically the hope, he is the hope of Israel. See, this is just an aside. In the Jewish context of religion, I know for us today we, we, we understand that salvation is an individual, individual calling of God in our lives, but the, the way they understood God's salvation was more, it was a corporate thing for them. It was a corporate thing. Even though individually they were having to respond to the Lord and the Lord's grace and the Lord's calling in their lives. But they always saw things in the workings of God in a corporate way. And so they tell him that. He says, God exalted him to, this, to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. By the way, don't miss this in this text. We, we will say to people, as Roy probably was told, that it's man's responsibility to simply do the things necessary for him to earn salvation. Look at where repentance even comes from in this text. It says, God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that what? That he might give what? Repentance. Guess where repentance comes from? It's from the Lord. It's not from, it's not from man. It's not that all of a sudden we've been pursuing God all this time and we go, ah, finally, I, got, I, I finally caught up with Jesus. It's never that way. Jesus said in John 6, 44, uh, unless the Father who sent me calls you unto himself, you cannot come. Now, yes, we respond by faith. As the Lord allows our hearts and the minds of our hearts to understand who, who, who God is in his holiness, and then we see our, our sinfulness because we see God in his holiness, then we're able to see our sinfulness, and we understand the consequences of our sinfulness and our rebellion against God, 
and our sins and our unrighteousness and our wickedness, and then we understand who Christ is, then we respond to him by faith. But all of that is being wrought about by the work of the Holy Spirit, by the work of Christ in our lives. And then he says this in verse 32, we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. They were being true to the call of the Lord. Remember what Jesus told them in, 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 in uh, Acts 1.8? Someone tell me what Acts 1.8 says. I see that hand. Thank you. Anyone? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and... And you shall be my witnesses. And he didn't say you shall do witnessing. Keep in mind, the state of being always precedes the act of doing things. The responsibility that you and I have is based on the reality of who who you and I are. You do not do things and then you become a witness. He said you are a witness and therefore you witness to what Christ has done. Which begs the question, if you're not... Speaking for Christ, are you really a witness? Verse 33, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put him to death. So they went from just simply telling two of the apostles, to arresting all of the apostles, putting them in jail, and now they want to put him to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood before the Sanhedrin ordered that the man be put outside for a little while. By the way, Gamaliel was one of those well-respected Pharisees of his days. Uh, uh, Acts chapter 22, verse 6 tells us Paul's testimony that he was under the tutelage of Gamaliel. In fact, uh, Daryl Bach, in his commentary in the book of, on the book of Acts, says this, quoting the Mishnah. He said that when Gamaliel died, the glory of the law ceased and purity and abstinence died. That's how well-respected he was. But he spoke, and he said this to them. Verse 35, then he addressed the men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to this man. Some time ago, Theudas appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore... In the present case, I advise you, leave this man alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. And it says in verse 40 that his speech persuaded them. But did they simply let him go? No. Look at the persecution as it continues on. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Forty lashes minus one. Every one of them. Three strands of, of leather looking belts with rocks or, or teeth or bones at the end of them ripping at their flesh. And they would get ripped from the back and also from the front. Just ripping their flesh 39 times. All 12 of the apostles. Normally this was a disgrace to them. Anytime you got flogged like that by the religious leaders, the order of the religious leaders by the Sanhedrin, it was because of a disgrace that you had done. And then, not only did they have them flogged, they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. What was the apostles' response? Look at verse 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin. Look at this. How did they leave the Sanhedrin? They were rejoicing. They were rejoicing. You could see the smiles on their faces as they left. Their, Their bodies were bleeding. And yet they had smiles on their faces and they were doing high fives. And they're going, that was cool. Not that the beating was cool. Look at the text. 
because they were rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, let me, let, let me, let me stop here for a minute. Look, look at me. Where we miss out on a lot of this is this. We normally think of suffering, pain, versus, for instance, uh, ease or security and all of that. We look at them from simply the perspective of who we are and how we live our lives. And so we say, if I'm going through suffering and some difficulties in life or pain of whatever that may be, and says, you know, I, I just want to get out of it. But have you ever noticed, like, parents? I, I, I think there was the, the, the recent uh, uh, tornado in Missouri. I don't know if you saw this, this uh, news article. The mom, to protect her two kids, two babies, covered those babies, and her legs were literally torn from underneath her. But you know what? You asked that mom. I didn't ask this, and I don't know. She may be weird, but. But you know, when there's a listen, when there is a cause much greater than the sum total of who you are, when there is a cause much greater than who you are, you're willing to suffer, you're willing to even give up your life for that. It is when we think that the sum total of life consists in who I am, in my comforts, and my happiness, then our perspective in life gets all messed up. This past week, I said that we went with, uh, I went with Kim, Kim and I went to Joshua's graduation at the Border Patrol Academy, and uh, that was Tuesday, but Monday night, he and I were just driving and back to Artesia, and I, and I asked him, I said, you know, I, I mentioned to Josh, I said, I have never thought of you nor Micah I guess I've never heard you guys talk about military type things. And he said to me, he said, Dad, when I was in eighth grade, when I was in eighth grade, you were taking me to school at, uh, at the only junior high in, in San Angelo, Glen Junior High. Um, sorry. <laughs> Some of you are going, we have more than one junior high. Uh, but anyway, he said, I was in eighth grade, and, and you asked me that. He said, have you ever thought about the military? And he said, my, I don't remember this conversation, but he said, Dad, my reaction to you was, I, no, no way, because I might die. And you told me, he said, son, there are causes that's worth giving up your life for. One is your country, and most importantly, is the Lord, the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, that got me thinking about life, and I know what he wants to do with his life. But listen, these guys are not masochists. These not, guys were not weird. These guys were not like, hey, that was cool. I got beat up. That's not what they were. But, they, but their hearts were so gripped by the understanding of who Christ was. They understood who God was, that the promise of God that was first mentioned in Genesis chapter 3 echoed through all of the prophets and through the life of the nation they knew him. They walked with him. They saw him. They saw him crucified. They saw him buried. And their hearts were, were, were in despair as a result of that. And they saw him alive. And they saw him do ministry. And then he gave him this commission. And they're saying, hey, there is a cause much greater than I am. Much greater than I, oh my, the totality of my life. And that is the cause of Christ. And, and I get beat up for that. So be it. And by the way, and I'm not going to go through that this morning. All of these guys, except for John, suffered a martyr's death. And then it says, verse 41, The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day, <laughs> they were told, hey, quit doing that. You can't, you can't preach Christ. You can't talk about your religion in a classroom. You can't talk about anything in a classroom or anything like that. Uh, we, this is separation of church and state. Do, do you not understand it? You cannot write about those things. You cannot, you cannot say, Merry Christmas. You cannot do any of these things. It is outlawed. You cannot say, you cannot, you cannot pray in anywhere. And these people look at what they, what they were doing, even though they were told to stop those things of proclaiming Christ. This is day after day in the temple courts. You know why they were in the temple courts? Because that's where the Jewish people were every day. And says, and from house to house, what was the house to house for? They were beginning to meet as worship, in worship services, for Acts 4, uh, uh, Acts 4 20, uh, 242. When they, it says, when they gathered for the apostles' teachings, for breaking of bread, for fellowship, and for prayer in houses. 
And, and you find this later on in Acts chapter 8, when, when, when Paul gathers them from house to house, going from house to house, dragging the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and persecuting them. But here and day, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never, listen, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. They never stop. You know why? Because when our hearts are gripped by the reality of who Christ is, we cannot help but speak about Christ. You know, I've said this many times. What comes out of your heart? What comes out of your mouth? What comes out of your writings? What, what are the books that you read? When people, when, when we do your funeral, what will people say that you spoke about, that your life was about? When you face the one who died for you, what will he say your life was about? In ancient Rome, and Kim and I had the privilege of being able to go to, to the Colosseum in Rome, but you know the history of the Colosseum where Christians were torn apart by wild animals as a form of entertainment for the public. Uh, a man named Paul Rader, who had been with the uh, Salvation Army, was educated at Asbury Seminary and also at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, he said this. He said, I stood he said, I stood uncovered to the heavens above where he sits for whom they gladly died and asked myself, would I, thinking about the people who had died there, the believers who had died there, would I, could I die for him tonight to get this gospel to the ends of the earth? Raider continued, I prayed most fervently in that Roman arena for the spirit of a martyr and for the working of the Holy Spirit in my heart. As he worked in Paul's heart when he brought him on on his handcuff way to Rome. Those early Christians, listen to what he said, those early Christians lived on the threshold of heaven within a heartbeat of home, no possessions to hold them back. They stood, they stood, here's earth, all our possessions, my house, my cars, everything I know, people's accolades, said, but they stood on the threshold of heaven. They could see heaven. No possessions holding them back. I want you to understand something. That is not something that simply they came, came up with. In fact, let me give you three truths as we close. Number one is this. Nothing, listen, nothing will ever stop the advance of the gospel message. Jesus said, upon this truth that I am the Christ, he said, I will build, I will build my church. And says, and even the gates of hell shall not prevent its onslaught. The sovereign God will carry out his redemptive plan, no matter the opposition that the enemy throws, no matter what government edicts say, no matter what your school superintendent says, no matter what your mom says or your dad says or your husband says, no matter what anybody says, no matter what anybody does, no matter the, the, the shortcomings of the church, God will sovereignly accomplish his redemptive purpose from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, and we will see the consummation one of these days. Second is this. Proclaiming the gospel is every believer's responsibility, privilege, and joy. When your heart is gripped by the reality of who God is, knowing him, you cannot help but speak about the things you have seen and heard about who Christ is. Third is this. Don't miss this. In the narrative of the, the book of Acts, it's not that these people simply pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and they get up one morning and say, I will stand tall for Christ. No, but their hearts were gripped by the Holy Spirit of God. God himself is the one who energizes them. The Holy Spirit is the energy behind our gospel presentation. You and I can't simply do it. In fact, you and I, we have to ask for the grace for every time that we have to face circumstances when we must choose whether to, to keep silent or open our mouths and open our lives and say, let Christ be known to people. Would you do that?